Hello gardeners, thank you so much for joining us for Mid-American Gardener. We're here to answer questions and generally just talk about all things plants, green and growing, possibly even insects and or disease and fruits and vegetables. But anyway, we're here to talk about plants and everything in the garden. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the crop sciences department. So my area is cut flowers as well as perennials in the landscape. But there are three really talented people here with me. Let's find out who they are and you can direct your questions in their expertise area. Let's start first with you, Dr. Bob Skirvin. Hello again. Uh, anyway, my, my name is Bob Skirvin. I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. And my specialty is uh, fruit crops. And I can do other things, but fruit crops is what I do best. Anyway, and uh, what I want to show you today is, is right, right now is raspberry season. And the strawberries are, are out too, but the strawberries are just kind of finishing up now. And it's raspberry season. And, there's, and, and the, be the best way to get raspberries is to go to a pick your own and take a pick your own raspberries and you can find them. But if, if not, there's a good alternative. Are these, at the grocery stores right now, they're on sale, coming in here in town, several stores have them on sale. These, these were very inexpensive. These were only a dollar a package for these. And the raspberries come in uh, these little clam packs, or I, th I think I showed you, showed you that before, these little things, that, that way they, they don't get crushed and you have a little pack here. And you also you can limit how many raspberries are in there, so you can't overpack it, it doesn't smash too badly. And they're really delicious. They're really, really good. And they're really good for you. They're full of all sorts of antioxidants and health benefits, and they keep you regular. And <laughs> a lot of things. Plus, they taste really good. They're really good in cereal in the morning. They're really good fresh in a lot of ways. And so you got to go to the, if you go, best way to do it, go pick your own. But if you can't mm -hmm. do that, and go to the grocery store because they're, they're in right now. It's a season. There are lots of them and they're really delicious right now. I have the little pink, white to pink ones, and they're not ready mm -hmm. yet, but I'm looking forward to it. The strawberries have been excellent this year. I mm -hmm. really have enjoyed those. Well, they're, thank they're really, you. Really good. Thank you, Bob. Now let's go to Paula Blakely. Hi, Paula. Hi. Hi. I'm Paula and I'm a horticulturist and I enjoy anything gardening, anything in the yard. Um, I have a sample of a plant here. It's actually a sample of a disease. It's called Azalea exabacidium gall, or leaf and flower gall. It is, I, I'm supposed to spell that, E-X-O-B-A-S-I-D-I-U-M, <laughs> exabacidium. There'll be a quiz later. <laughs> yes. I asked Paula to thank you very much for spelling that. Uh, this is a disease that affects flowers a plant's leaves and and um, flowers sometimes. It, the, it's a fungus that overwinters on the plant, and this is the the, the beginning of the gall. Um, this shows it affecting the leaf and how you see some leaf curl there. You there's really nothing you can do about it. You can spray a fungicide um, in the early spring. It's more of a preventative. But I think the best thing you can do is just pinch off the, the gall itself and get it out of there. If you don't, the um, gall will end up spreading spores in the spring the following year. So, and these are off of an azalea in my very own yard. So, Did you know that you had them on there? Had you been watching it or had it? I just caught it last night, but I've had it in other years. It's a plant, I'm sorry, it's affected by moisture. The plants affect mm -hmm. the gall is, the fungus is affected by moisture. So um, on certain, all the temps have to be right and mm -hmm. moisture level has to be right. But and gee, we overhead got watering, the right stuff. Lots this of rain, spring. lots of rain. Yeah, and be sure it, when you cut off these galls, don't put them in your compost pile or stay, throw them away. Get, get, get them in the garbage. Get them, get them out. Of, you you don't want those spores hanging around because otherwise they're gonna, you'll have even more problem next year. Mm -hmm. yeah. so get it off pinch, site. Pinch them off before they, and, and they're at this stage here. They're easy to go. The spores have not yet been released. And, and if you can't burn them, one of the other things I always suggest would dig a hole and bury it a foot deep. Then they can't get out either. Okay. So one or the other. So that's very interesting. Thank you, Paula. Okay, now we're going to go on to Jim Schuster. Okay. Uh, this person has a Cleveland pear tree, and that looks like it's dying. And uh, based on the pictures, uh, I'm betting that they have a fire blight which is a common problem on pear. 
And it's depending on how much rain you have, you can just kill a small section back, or it may take the branch all the way back to the trunk. And if you're in Michigan, for example, it may take it all the way to the ground. The uh, best control for fire blight is to prune it out when it's dry. Hot and dry is ideal. Um, and you do not want to uh, prune it when it's wet for any reason, whether it's rain or overhead watering, because moisture is what helps spread it. And you want to prune off the dead stuff at least, and they used to say six inches, but it's been pushed to a foot below. But don't leave a stub. Try and cut down below that foot if you have to, to a side branch, a, an active bud, or even, if necessary, all the way back to the trunk. And uh, try and, like I say, as soon as you see it, and it's dry, prune it. Mm -hmm. And sterilize the pruning tools with a 10% chlorine bleach solution between every single cut. And that is important. Yes. Jim, should, should you dig and get, get rid of those cuttings too? Yes, and, yes, and, and you thank you. Uh, yeah, you? and these are a little bit harder to dig and bury, but if you've got a, a fire pit, you can burn them in, burn them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to take them in and burn them in my fireplace inside. Even though it may be spring. <laughs> well, that's a good idea, though, because yeah. you don't want that hanging around. Right. Okay. Well, boy, all kinds of things to think about. I do have some of my favorite things for the spring, and so I harvested some of the peas from my garden just a moment ago, not too long ago, and we like the sugar snap type peas. So this is Oregon mm. Sugar Pod 2, and I've been growing this for quite a long time. It, I have a connection to a PBS show because Roger Swain on Victory Garden is where I first got my idea, and I purchased the seeds locally. But then I also have the little sugar snap one as well, and it's a smaller one, doesn't get as big, but they're equally sweet, and I just pick them and pop them in my mouth and eat them right from the garden. They're just wonderful. So peas, if you haven't grown them, they're quite easy. I started them in March this year or in April, and I've got successive ones, so I've got some that are about 10 uh, days to two weeks later. So enjoy getting those early crops, because now the work is done, you just get to eat them. And they're really quick, maybe just a two, three minutes saute, and they go from um, this color to a brighter green. Don't overcook those, don't overcook asparagus. It's just a little bit of a saute. Okay, well with that, we're gonna go to a little did you know about strawberries. Strawberries are the only fruit that wear their seeds on the outside. The average berry is adorned with 200 seeds. Uh-oh, I was caught eating the peas. <laughs> <laughs> Bob's been eating raspberries and I'm over here eating peas. Got a okay, whole I'll meal wait here tonight. <laughs> I'll wait and, and go a little bit later don't on. Eat the, on the yeah, don't eat azaleas. On the snack. Yeah, don't eat azaleas or the know. paper about okay. Right. <laughs> All right, well let's go to the phone lines next. And Judy has a question about blackberries on line one. Hi there, Judy. Hi, Diane. Um, we have had um, a row of straw or of uh, blackberries for maybe eight years. Last year, and again this year, they, the, they, the canes are there, they, they leaf out, but only the bottom half gets a lot of leaves. The top half of, of the long canes will maybe have a, a, maybe three or four clusters of small leaves all along the top half of those canes, and they don't do anything. We only get berries, the, the bottom half blossoms out, and we get berries from that, but nothing on the upper half of the cane. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, Bob. <coughs> <Now do> you, <coughs> I'm talking bad. Uh, do you have thornless blackberries? Are they thornless? Yes. Okay. Yeah, what, what happened to thornless blackberries is that thornless blackberries die from the tip. And so I, you probably see my arms sticking out here before, but basically what happens is you get these big long shoots and the thornless blackberries can have 15 foot shoots sometimes. And what happens is during the winter time is they start dying back from the tip and they die, die back, die back, die back. And that's what you're seeing there. Now the ones that are doing best are the ones that are down low. And, I, and um, it even could be snow. Like last year we had the snow, it would have been the ones that were they were actually buried in the snow were the ones that survived the best. 
Uh, this year, you're still getting more protection out here in the middle of the plant than you are in the top, and so those, those buds are doing better. Now, one of the things that you do with blackberries, is, with thorns blackberries, is you, you don't prune during the winter time. You wait until uh, late winter, so probably back in March, is you take and go and take and look at you can and you can take it with your clipper to kind of clip back until you get the healthy wood. The tips so die back and then go go back, and then the the fruiting wood is going to be down here. If it's a real mild winter, they'll fruit all the way along mm -hmm. the whole thing. But it's not very often we get a mild winter like that. And this winter was you know it was a it was a funny it got really cold and then got kind of warm. And it's killing there. But the part that survives is under the snow is the best. And that's there. And sometimes, uh, if you if you pick, pick blackberries in the woods, the, the blackberries where you find them is right along the edge of the woods, mm -hmm. where they get where they get protection along that. Sometimes along the railroads, where all the cardboard blows over them and so forth, and, and they get protection that way. But the part that's sticking out here is probably dead or not healthy. Well, we had a few years that were mild, but now we're back to more yeah, of a winter. So <coughs> yeah, last so winter was terrible. Th th this winter was was not great, but. But last winter was terrible. Does she trim that back or just let it go until it's yeah, but I, older? I think I'd probably just cut, cut off yeah. that stuff as non-productive. Non but if you like it, you can keep it. Okay. Very good. Good timing for asking blackberry questions. Let's go to line two next. And Peggy's going to ask uh, something about crab apples. Hi there, Peggy. Hi. Um, I have a, a, a crab apple tree. It's probably about 25 years old. And... It puts out so many suckers from the root that it almost looks like a little bush around the trunk. And every summer I have to cut that back three or four times to keep it looking nice. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's any way to uh, take care of those suckers, prevent the suckering that wouldn't harm the tree itself. There is a chemical you can get. Um, I just know the name brand. It's called Sucker Stopper. Uh, I don't know the chemical that's in it, and you would spray that uh, regularly every few weeks, and it's supposed to help keep the suckers from growing as fast. I think it's it's a hormone that keeps the suckers the suckers from actually growing as fast as they do. Right. So, and you would want to get something labeled for that because yeah, anything else would go back yeah, into don't, the don't don't go and use Roundup on it like you know some people say you can do because um, you're just going to end up destroying the root system of the tree itself. Yeah. And one of the things that's interesting about the crab apples and other apples is that they're grafted plants, and so what happens is it, is the rootstock, the part that they're growing on the underground, is different than the top. And usually the rootstock is a sort of uh, apple, like a little, cra little crab apple, and maybe one gets disease or something, but it's been chosen specifically because it makes a smaller tree, or else it, it'll make one that's more disease resistant, or more, more tolerant of wet soils or something. But it's not the same as your tree. And so when they start growing into the bottom, then that's a, it's just different varieties, it's, it's a mixture. And also when you get a lots of rootstock, you think, well, just let them go back a little bush down there. You get a lot of diseases, you get a lot of, a lot of insects down there, you get, you get fi fire blight growing in here, you don't get good air circulation. You need to get them out. And mo most cases what they do in commercial orchards is you just send your crew out on a regular basis and cut out those stupid suckers. It's just part, <laughs> it's just part of production. Mm -hmm. and, and the suckering started because you probably had the base of the trunk banged or injured somehow with a lawnmower or hoeing or when you're doing weeding. Mm -hmm. And once they start suckering, they don't ever stop unless you keep this chemical going on them. Uh, but otherwise, the only other control is you replace the tree. And often the tree is so nice yeah. that you do want to just come along and not wait till it's up in the tree, but wait, you know, get it while it's down and easy to find. So, wow, that was a good question and you are not alone <laughs> with your, mm -hmm. the concerns about the suckering. Okay, let's go to Greg's question on line three, and it's about um, a sour cherry. Is that right, Greg? Yes. My friend has sour cherries trees on mm -hmm. his property, and uh, I'm trying to get some of them to grow. I, I He... Uh, uh, they uh, send roots through the uh, ground, and they pop up all over the yard. And if he doesn't mow them, they, he'd have cherry trees all over his yard. Anyway, I uh, I dug some of the shoots up that were coming up out of the ground, and I'm trying to 
to grow a couple of them, and they don't seem to want to take. Now, I, pr well, probably the best <clears throat> thing to do is, is is buy a tree. Is in the springtime. <laughs> is there some there are there are a number of varieties of these sour cherries make make your pie, but they're specifically selected for disease resistance and. And they're in winter hardiness, and you're going to get a better tree with it. And are you sure that the sour tree, uh, uh, sour cherry, is an edible one? Because I mean, there are a lot of wild cherry trees that you don't really want either. So the question is, is it one of the edible cherries? Yeah, because yeah, some some of the cherries have more cyanide than others, and some just don't taste good. And some the birds can eat pretty well. You don't want to eat them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing you might try doing is if you take the sucker and actually put it, or the, the plant, put it in a pot and grow it in the pot until it has a good root system. That's a good and, idea. and then you yeah. can transplant it at a later date. It might just be too much stress digging it up and replanting it outside. So it's basically like layering, where you would put you it, do but that layer too, it into yeah. a pot. I yes. mean, it's the same. So it doesn't have to have all of the nutrients coming up through a small little spindly root system. And the other thing, maybe the timing of when he's digging them. And you don't want to dig them in the middle of the summer either. Mm -hmm. You want to do it early in the spring so that they're uh, not even butted out yet. They're just, you know, food is going into the chute, but uh, you haven't gotten any uh, leaves forming because then it, they transplant better too. So if it's a hybrid, would it still, he wouldn't be able, to, it might not be growing as well, so he's got to make sure it's not a hybrid too. Are there, well, sweet, the, are there sour the, cherry the, well, hybrids? Well, the, the seedlings, is when you get into seedlings, you get all sorts of stuff. You got little cherries, big cherries, all, all sorts of stuff. Some are sour, some have a lot of cyanide, some is, taste awful. You might go going, going out in the woods. If you've ever been out there and eating some wild cherries, they make wild, wild cherry jam, but it's a lot of work. Little itty bitty cherries, you have to believe that, and they don't taste very good, and you got to clean them up. But these would be rooting from that tree, wouldn't yeah, they? It, it from sound, the sounds of like it? Like you were trying to dig up seedlings, they were all coming up. From, I would sure try. I mean, if that's an edible mm -hmm. tree, and he likes it, and you like the cherry, I would certainly it's try grandma's it. Grandma's cherry tree, and you want to have some of it. Try it to a container, it. not mm -hmm. to its yeah. own that's root system. That's probably the best advice. Yeah, well, try that. Or that just sounds like buy a cultivar. I believe that's the easiest <laughs> way. To go, buy, buy one. For Although me. I understand his, I like to grow things from seed. I like to do layering. I like to see it from a small growth. So I would try that. Um, I did move some layered plants that layered some shrubs that layered themselves without much help from me and I did it in early April and they didn't even know they were moved in most cases well, so now what Diane is talking about the layering is sometimes when plants kind of flop over and they get against the ground then they, they will root spontaneously and so if you really like that tree one thing you can do is one of the old men worked in my lab for a long time and he, he, he called the big rock method. And you think of yes. the branch over here and put a big rock right there. <laughs> to kind of cut the underside first, put a big rock there, and come back a year later, you got a little rooted plant. And then you cut that off and put it in. <laughs> so scientific layered. sounding, but it's exactly a good <laughs> way to do it. So there so you, you go. Can, so so you try can do it. that. That might be the, the best way. If you, that, that's an important plant for you, that's a good way to do okay, it. Great. Then try it. Well, good. You got a lot of. Uh, you elicited a lot of response <laughs> on your shower, sour cherry question. Let's go on then to a tenuous question about wisteria on line five. Hi, what's your question? Tenu, is that you? It sounds like someone is there, but no one is talking. Hello? Okay, I guess we're not going to get a wisteria question. That was I was looking forward to that. Okay, Donna on line four. What about uh, hibiscus? What's your question? Yes, I really enjoy your program. Thank you. I got a beautiful hibiscus tree for Mother's Day, and we have it out on the deck, and we live next to a squirrel infested wood. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say infested? <laughs> yes. <coughs> moss balls and uh, some bleach, you know, set it around close. Like maybe we could discourage them. Do you have any any ideas? This sounds like a familiar conversation that we had before the show. Okay, what would we tell her about squirrels? There is not a lot that <laughs> squirrels don't go after, right. and there's not a lot of things that keep them away. 
And, and mothballs. Blood are, meals is one thing, yeah. mothballs, blood but, meal. But mothballs is not recommended by the conservation people because as they melt down, birds eat them and then die because the birds think it's grit. Oh, so they don't that's recommend, right. and, and, if you, and you definitely don't want to use mothballs around a food crop because we tried that once and all the squashes in that, when you cut them open, smelt like mothballs. Mm. They picked up the naphthalene, so you don't want to use it around any food crop, but preferably don't use mothballs outside at all for an animal or something, just from a wildlife safety point of view. Okay, so give her an idea of what she can do. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, I don't I'd have any I'd say blood idea. meal is one of the few things that, that might work. Um, and, and you know, there's rabbit scram, there's deer scram, there are, and, and most of those things either have putrescent eggs or they have uh, blood meal or a combination of castor oils, all sorts of different things. Um, but nothing is guaranteed with squirrels. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just awful. And you mentioned the blood meal, that oxidizes pretty fast, so you almost got to use it daily. You know, within 24 hours, it's lost the effectiveness of it. So, yeah, wow. for you. And, and blood meal has caused problems in our. Uh, uh, time and not when I used to run a fuel station, uh, it also caused problems when you use it over and over and over. Because yeah. it's adding to the soil yeah, it's and it's over adding nitrogen. Yeah, it gives you the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So that's, we're not very helpful. You can catch the squirrels, I guess. Exclusion. Do, 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 a, do a lot of live trapping and yeah, take which you would, your neighbors. You may have to away. have a professional mm -hmm. uh, doing that too. So it is a difficult. It's you might try thing. some sort of um, um, thing that goes off uh, oh, water, oh. water sprayer mm -hmm. that, that, that is motion activated. I think there's some out on the market that... That'd that, be a surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might work. Yeah, and, the, and that element of surprise might be helpful. So anyway, we're giving you a few hints, Donna, so I hope that that helps you. But also, it's as helpful to know what not to do. Okay, we have just a little more time left, but Bob, I was going to have you do another okay. little question. All right, so anyway, I got, I got a question here that was from Alice E., whoever Alice L. Alice. Anyway, uh, she wanted to know about a pineapple plant. How do I start a pineapple plant? And so that's a cool one. I like that one. I, I, I tell my students all the time in class. Anyway, a pineapple plant is, first of all, pineapple is real easy to grow because pineapples do not have to grow in soil. They're called epiphytes. And when you go into, into jungles, they're the, they're the plants you, that you find growing on, on branches and, and they way up high, all sorts of plants. They don't have to have that. And so they don't need a lot of soil. They do well in soil. They need kind of a light soil. And the way you propagate them is the top. You just take the, the top off. I don't have a pineapple here. You just <laughs> <laughs> exactly. br 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 break off the top. And, and then the, ideally, then you take it and kind of lay it aside, let, let, it, let it dry for a week or something just on, on the tabletop, and then you stick it in soil. It, it, if you look real carefully, when you have your pineapple, if, if you take off the cap, kind of peel back some of those lower leaves, you'll see the roots are already there. It has little, little, little pointy things. Like, if you don't know what they are, you might think they're insects, but they're little roots already preformed. And so then you take and put it into, I tell my students, put it in sand, but so, some kind of a, a light, well-drained material and the plant will root. Now, what I, w once you get it in roots, you got a plant, it's kind of a pretty plant. And then uh, what I have done with mine is then you take it outside during the summertime and let, and let it get all the leaves, you know, all the sunlight, and it really grows like mad, it does real well. And then during the wintertime, you got to dig it up or break, bring the pot back inside because they will not take the cold. And then in the summer, you take it back out again. When you finally want it to flower, the way you make it flower is by ethylene. And what uh, it's recommended, and what we, I've done it before, is you take a big bag, and that's a trick you put it in, like a, like a laundry bag, those things you get to dry clean in like that, put it mm -hmm. around the plant. And it's not easy, because they're pretty prickly. And put like six apples inside, and the apples give off a gas called ethylene, and the ethylene will stimulate your pineapple to flower, and you'll end up with a pineapple. I remember one time I did this, and after six years, I end up with a pineapple about the size of a softball. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's a lot, uh, you're a lot better off to go to, Go, the, go, go, go buy to the grocery store, go buy too. one. But it's fun. You can fiddle around with it. So it's nice, but you're, you're it's planning on making plan. money you at it. You can say you did it's it a yourself. Plan, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a novel thing. <laughs> but <laughs> ethylene can cause problems for cut flowers, but it can also, yeah, like it's in this case, stimulate flower. flowering. That's, that's that's flowering. flowering. If you're going to have one, after five years of investment, you might as well get a pineapple. <laughs> Or go get one. <laughs> or get a bigger one for a lot cheaper at the grocery store. <laughs> and less time involved. 
Well, th I thought that was a good one to have a little bit of a, um, uh, from the gar from the kitchen. <laughs> well, let's go to a tomato uh, special mag quiz next. We all eat tomatoes, but do you know where they originated? A, South America, B, Africa, C, Australia, D, Asia. A, South America. Tomatoes originated in South American Andes, and its use as a very popular food originated in Mexico. It later spread across the world and is consumed in many ways. The variety of plants, it's just so interesting and, and I'm enjoying all of your questions as well. Thank you three so much for being here. Thank we you. appreciate all of their expertise and your calls. Have a great week gardening. Goodbye. <laughs>